Not Bill Gates, PowerPoint. But okay. <laughs> and and I also want to make the remark. Yesterday we heard that uh, that Kate Kirby is the how do you put it the poor relation of Fano. Uh, we learned that Joe Masick is the uh, uh, the illegitimate child of Fano. And uh, as for myself, the final PhD student of Ugo Fano, I sometimes think probably I was an accident. <laughs> In any event, one of the most important things uh, about the way of doing physics that Ugo taught all of us is to take a complex problem and look inside for the simple nugget of simplicity uh, around which to build your idea of the physics. And then the details can be put in later on. And so the story I'm going to tell today is uh, is about a fairly complex problem, scattering of two molecules at ultra-low temperatures. Um, and I don't want to face that problem as a whole, because as, as Bo suggested, I'm an atomic physicist, not a chemist. So we want to find the simplicity inside of this problem. Uh, and there is one, and that's the story today. Uh, the people working in my group on cold molecules are a postdoc and a student. We've had useful discussions with Jeremy Hudson, who's visiting uh, Joa right now. And not everybody in the audience uh, is an expert on cold collisions, although soon you probably will be. So here I'm going to put up a, a rough overview of the energy scales in atomic physics, starting from electronic excitation way up there, all the way down here to Bose-Einstein condensation, which uh, is, of course, characterized by the fact that the de Broglie wavelengths are really enormous, and there are uh, interesting quantum mechanical effects that you have to deal with. The main point I want to get across here is that the experimental techniques for making atoms cold, say laser cooling, or for making molecules cold, Stark slowing is one example of that, tend to come in, uh, well, Stark slowing is a little higher, but whatever. They tend to come in at, at temperatures lower than characteristic energies of excitation of atoms and molecules. And this is important. It kind of inverts your uh, appreciation of molecular collisions. Because now, if you have a very cold gas, translationally cold gas, if there's any kind of inelastic process where the state changes inside the molecule, this is probably a bad thing, because it's going to release a lot of energy compared to the temperature. And it goes into heating. It goes into loss of molecules from the trap. This is an important part of our story. And we've done a lot of work, actually, trying to guess what will happen to molecules in this environment. How likely are they to make inelastic transitions? But I won't talk about that today. Uh, I will speak of uh, Kelvin as if it's an energy unit, but this doesn't trouble anybody here, the conversion factors. Uh, and I want to spend a few minutes saying what's the big deal about ultra-cold molecules. And the main thing is uh, they are the next natural step beyond cold atoms. And you hardly have to advertise cold atoms anymore these days. Uh, but I do want to dwell a little bit on what's new about molecules. So you get everything you get from ultra-cold atoms. Uh, only more so. For example, precision measurements are always a good thing to, to put on grant proposals and so forth. But there are interesting and different things in cold molecules. If you look at cold alkali atoms um, moving very slowly with respect to each other, this as a way of emphasizing the long-range forces, because they spend a very long time approaching each other subject to long-range forces. But for alkali atoms, it's the, the weak, puny, uh, van der Waals force that does most of the action. If you have molecules, if you have polar molecules with permanent electric dipole moments in their ground state, these interactions are much, much stronger. They are badly, strongly anisotropic. And presumably, they would lead to interesting new collisions and interesting new Bose condensates. And people have discussed ideas for this sort of thing. And in fact, it's polar molecules that I'll be talking about today. Uh, cold molecules have been suggested for applications to quantum information. I think Carl Williams will say something about that later on in this session. Um, cold chemistry is something that's brand new. Alkali atoms don't have much going on in the way of chemistry at cold temperatures. Uh, chemistry at ultra-cold temperatures is, is a brand new field. We know very little about it, except for some pioneering work by Alex Dogarno and, and Balakrishnan, who was in the audience. Uh, and in the end, we want to keep this always in mind. One thing we have learned in ultra-cold atoms one thing we've really come to expect in ultra-cold atoms is that you can influence what the scattering does by applying external fields. And the, the most prominent example is you can tune a magnetic field to bring a Feshbach resonance uh, to, to zero energy, to threshold. 
And you can tune the scattering length and various properties of the gas. And Steve Harris talked a little bit about that yesterday. Uh, and frankly, when there's chemistry going on, when there are molecules, we're going to demand this. And we're going to look for ways that we can influence the way chemistry goes. And I might say a little bit about that. Um, this is a very new field. I want to summarize very quickly the experimental situation. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of the ways that cold molecules are being made, but it's a reasonably representative list in the sense that there are two main techniques for making cold molecules these days. One is to note that, well, we have cold atoms already. Can't we just put them together and make cold molecules out of them? And the answer is yes. Uh, quite a number of people, uh, Paul Lett is not on this list, sorry about that, Paul, uh, have been making molecules by welding them together using lasers in a process called photoassociation. You can also, it turns out, ramp a magnetic field because you have this magnetic field control over, uh, over the atoms. You can make molecules that way. And the catch is, when you do either of these processes, the molecules tend to end up in very highly excited vibrational states. And from the standpoint of cold collisions, a very likely thing to happen is that something else will come along, hit this molecule, make it de-excite to a lower vibrational state, and that's a lot of energy released. This is one of these bad inelastic processes that leads to heating and trap loss and so forth. This is starting to be, get characterized theoretically as well, but uh, I'm not going to talk about any of this. These are hard problems, and really they sort of focus on things going bad. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm painting a bad <laughs> picture of it, but... Uh, but it's my justification for leaving these aside and looking at other techniques which have been invented really specifically to make cold molecules. So for example, John Doyle down at Harvard could put molecules in an ambient cold buffer gas of helium and they cool down to the temperature of the buffer gas. Likewise, uh, Gerard Meyer and John Yi independently are doing a stark slowing technique illustrated here. It's like a linear accelerator in reverse. If you have a polar molecule coming along here it, uh, in the right orientation, it's climbing uphill to these electrodes, and as soon as it gets past them, you switch the polarity so it's climbing uphill to these electrodes, it's climbing uphill to these, it's climbing uphill to these, and the molecules are slow when they get down to the end. So these are great techniques in the sense that they give you ground state molecules, and that's something that, uh, as a theorist, I can wrap my head around a little easier, but they don't get as translationally cold. They get to some fraction of a Kelvin, and you're kind of stuck there, and, and so there's work going on to see how you can get them colder. But these are also very general techniques, and uh, there are many potential molecules. Some of these have actually been cooled by these techniques. Um, oh, and so I, I also put this up just to emphasize that as far as hard data go, there are actually a small handful of experiments that have ever measured any cross-sections involving molecules at temperatures below, well below one Kelvin, let's say. So it's a very new field, and when a theorist comes to a field this new, there are kind of two things I could do. One is I could look for something novel and interesting that molecules will bring to us. Or the other is I could make estimates of quantities that experimentalists actually care about and could be useful for something. And so in this talk, it will be neither. No, no, it will be both. So the novelty uh, that I'm going to talk about considers polar molecules in collision. And what I'm going to discover here is a new class of bound states of two polar molecules where the molecules are bound at very large distances from each other, say 100 atomic units or so. And so they are states that we can think about <coughs> pretty well from ab initio principles. I'll call them field length because they depend on electric field in a way I'll talk about later. Uh, but it turns out these are not just uh, interesting new things. They can be used for things like estimating the stability of the gas against bad collisions happening. Uh, also, perhaps for measuring scattering lengths using photo association microwave frequencies, and maybe even influence over chemical processes. Maybe not. We'll have to see. Uh, so the molecule I'm going to talk about today, the one we've been working on, is OH, uh, primarily because there are at least two experiments that are cooling and trapping this molecule right now. And Here's where the simplifications start, right? So there's a lot going on in OH. There's a lot going on in any molecule. So right away, we assume it's been produced in buffer gas cooling or Stark slowing or some process where it's in its electronic ground state and vibrational ground state. And coming into this field as an atomic physicist rather than a chemist, what I really want is to think of these molecules as funny-looking little atoms with a few extra quantum numbers. And so the fact that they're rigid rotors means I think 
mostly about the rotational quantum numbers, the spin and things like this, and, and don't worry about the rest. And this will sort of be justified after the fact, once we start to look at the potential curves. Uh, likewise, when the rotational ground state, the Jagel 3 halves ground state is, uh, is 84 Kelvin away from the first excited state, we're not going to worry about that. Um, OH is a pretty good Huns case A molecule, which means uh, in addition to worrying about the projection of angular momentum around the electric field axis in the lab, we have to worry about the projection of angular momentum around the body frame, but the plus and minus three halves projections, again, are fairly well decoupled from the plus and minus one half projections, and there's some energy difference, so we're going to stick with just the three halves. Um, we do want to include hyperfine structure because it's something that itself happens on a very small energy scale. We always have to deal with hyperfine structure. The proton has a spin of one half. And so our quantum numbers in the end are the total spin, its projection on the lab, the projection of the electronic spin on the molecular axis, and a parity index, plus or minus, which is a good quantum number in zero field, but which gets mixed up uh, as we turn the field on. So we'll put in the Stark effect, we'll put in all these things. But this already, we're making all these simplifications. Well, no harm in that. Here's a gratuitous picture of the Stark effect of the OH molecule, just to show you what it looks like. We have electric field on this axis, energy on this axis, uh, apparently in wave numbers rather than Kelvin. And in zero field, there are two parity eigenstates labeled E and F, separated by an energy, which is the lambda doublet splitting, about 0.05 wave numbers. And as we turn the field on, we see a, a very nice Stark effect going from quadratic to linear, and it becomes linear at around 1,000 volts per centimeter. There are details here because of hyperfine structure, because of the, the other quantum numbers, but that's not really important. What's important is that there are two classes of states, the lower energy ones, which align along the field, and the higher energy ones, which align anti-along the field. And so, so even though we keep track of all these details, for the sake of the talk, you only have to think about the little arrows and we'll be fine. Then we have to worry about the interaction between two OH molecules. And here things get a little harder because uh, this is a, a pretty complicated interaction. OH is an o open shell molecule uh, and there's a lot going on. Well, some parts are easy. We need to know the kinetic energy of each of the molecules. We need to know the fine structure of each of the molecules, including the Stark effect. Uh, we'll skip that. We'll come back to uh, out here the um, the dipole-dipole interaction is the main thing that we're going to work on. There's a quadrupole-quadrupole interaction. There's a, a dispersion interaction at long range. And then, let's see, have I forgotten anything? I think that's probably it. That's the whole thing. Oh, no. There's the exchange interaction between the molecules. And this is very complicated. Uh, it's, moreover, pretty poorly characterized, especially at the longer intermolecular separations that we care about. Uh, there are four singlet potential energy surfaces and four triplet potential energy surfaces. There are kind of some beginnings to ab initio calculations of these things. But we are cold collision theorists. We don't care what happens when, atom when molecules get close together. We care about long-range forces. And so what we're going to do is replace the entire exchange interaction with a single isotropic potential and be done with it. Okay. This is the big simplification that's going on. We don't know, even if we did know what the surface was down there, usually it's not good enough to calculate a scattering length anyway. You know, this is just the way of the world in this business. Uh, but because we do have a short range potential, we can adjust the scattering length and we can see what happens in very small. No, not even that. It's just, just the same in every spin state. We just, we just leave it alone. Uh, and so, the picture we take of it is this. If I think of the schematic interaction between two OH molecules as potential versus R, when they get very close together, this is one of the pieces we're leaving out, the, the chemical binding interactions here, the hydrogen peroxide molecule is bound relative to two OH molecules by 50,000 Kelvin. That's a lot going on here. Uh, moreover, this down here, it's not a good approximation to treat these as rigid rotors, right? There are strong chemical forces. Bonds are being broken. It's not completely unlikely that water is formed in cold collisions of OH molecules. Uh, but this is all done on the scale of about five atomic units. Uh, and as we get out a little further, in the scale of tens of atomic units, there is a secondary minimum here, whose depth is more like a couple thousand Kelvin. 
uh, where hydrogen bonding forces take place, and the molecules, instead of aligning like this in hydrogen peroxide, tend to want to align like this. Uh, and that's okay. And in fact, our isotropic potential is going to be about this deep and have about this scale to sort of get that part into it. But the part we're really interested in is further out still, out here in the land of uh, dipole-dipole interactions. And what we're going to find is that there are bound states, bound by dipole forces, whose binding energies are on the order of one Kelvin, or maybe quite a bit less. And the scale can be essentially arbitrarily large, tens or hundreds, maybe thousands of atomic units. And so from the standpoint, again, of the cold collisions theorist who cares mostly about the long-range interactions out here, we'll say, well, we'll treat this pretty thoroughly out here, the dipole-dipole interaction. And when the molecules get closer together, something else happens. And we're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to mock it up with something. We'll have to come back to this later, of course. But um, uh, as I say, there's no data yet, right? So we can kind of do anything we want just to get ourselves off the ground. So what I'm going to do now is start to focus in on these long-range states out here and show you what they're like. So here is a set of Anastagash adiabatic potential energy curves in our approximation, having thrown out all the quantum numbers that I told you about. Here we've applied an electric field of 10,000 volts per centimeter. And what we see is, well, at large intermolecular separation, there are a bunch of thresholds given basically by the Stark shift. As we get to smaller and smaller r, the dipole forces kick in on that scale. We see a lot of avoided crossings here. A lot of things are going to happen. But the most interesting thing that comes out are these sets of adiabatic curves up here, which have inner turning points already at 50 atomic units. And what it means is, if we start two molecules scattering in a channel like this, they'll come together, they'll scatter in this potential, they'll go out, and they'll never experience all the awful things that can happen here at small r. And so this is our nugget of simplicity. We've thrown out the exchange interaction, but if we are careful about it, we can look at a case where we never experienced the exchange interaction, and we can go ahead and start to calculate things. So for the tiny, tiny energy range that we're interested in, for the very large range of R that we're interested in, this is actually not a, a terribly bad model. The main thing here is the dipole interaction. We're including the dipole interaction. Uh, what, we're, what we've left out of this particular model, and this is the one I'll show you calculations of, by the way, What's left out of here are higher order partial waves. This includes S and D partial waves. That's a bad approximation. It takes a lot more, really. But if you put them in, all you get for your effort is a longer calculation that takes more time to run. All the qualitative things that I'm going to tell you about are already in this model. I, I'll show in the next picture, we get a better sense of where the dipoles are. So, so these are the actual curves. To understand these curves better, I'm going to take one step further back. I'll take this Hamiltonian, and I'm going to take a sub-Hamiltonian of that just to show what's going on. And this will be sort of the real bare-bones model of the molecular scattering. So here we are. We've left ourselves now just three thresholds. The molecules are either both along, one along, one against, or both against the electric field. And now, suppose I bring two of them together. Let's say. I look at these two at the highest threshold. They're both pointing against the field. And so now if I bring them together, roughly speaking, they can come together in a way in which they're attractive or a way in which they're repulsive. And so, I mean, there's a lot more going on, of course. But in the bare bones model, there's the attractive one. Here's the repulsive one, sort of given by the relative orientation of the dipoles in the arrow. This is kind of, does this answer your question, Steve? Yeah. Likewise, at the middle threshold, there's an attractive one and a repulsive one. And aha, look here. There's a crossing between this curve and this curve. And that's what generates our bound state. And that's what generates our potential. And then there are bound states of this potential. Yeah? But if, in reality, this is, if, if I look in the angular of that, so those two, two top curves are just different orientations of the dipoles. Yes. From a collision point of view. So, so this is a minimum in a, in a three dimensional cancel. Yes. And avoided cross between two row surfaces. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, and now there's an electric field dependence on this. So this is, again, shown at, uh, at 10,000 volts per centimeter electric field. If I were to increase the field, the Stark effect gets bigger. It has the effect of making this potential get deeper and deeper. 
And in fact, for experimentally realizable fields for the OH molecule, you can turn the field up high enough that you introduce more and more bound states into this potential. So the number of bound states depends on the field. And in fact, if we go the other way, if I turn the field down, I'm moving these, potentials, uh, these thresholds closer together, the potential gets more and more shallow. And eventually, at some point, which is about 2,000 volts per centimeter for this molecule, the potential is too shallow to hold any bound states at all. And so what it means is that the bound states that I'm talking about, two molecules held together 50 or 100 atomic units apart, the, these bound states do not exist in the absence of an electric field. And therefore, we refer to them as field-linked states. They're put together because the field is there. If you like, they're a bound state of two molecules and the field and the capacitor plates and the earth on which they sit. Yeah, Robbie? Actually, in a way, the dipole uh, aspect of the OH doesn't exist if you didn't have the electric field. If you're in the lower state, That's right. there's no dipole. That's right. It, it, so it's entirely due to the electric field, what you're talking about. Yeah. So that leads to me a question. I mean, how, what is the OH aspect of this? Uh, how do you mean the OH aspect? Uh, in a way, I mean, if I understand you correctly, this, you're saying this is a very general yes. feature of anything that has a lambda doublet splitting. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I agree. The, the aspect of OH is to set the actual scale. Uh, what is the exact value of the field where the states go away? And that's about it. I, I think you're right. Any polar molecules would exhibit this. Uh, OK, so now we have these bound states up here. What do they mean for scattering? Well, let's start by looking at scattering of two of these weak field seeking states. So they're going to come in, scatter, and go off. Uh, and here we have the rate constant for elastic scattering as a function of the electric field. And what we see is, sure enough, as the field gets beyond a certain value, we see these oscillations, these strong peaks in the elastic scattering. What's happening there? Well, every once in a while, the field gets to the point where you introduce a new bound state into this potential. When you have a bound state at threshold, that makes a resonance. Okay, and we're seeing here four of them. Down here, there are no, down here somewhere, there are no bound states. Up here, there are four. So right away, this is good news, right? This is the kind of thing we love to see in cold collisions. We're tuning the scattering length by adjusting an external electric field. That's wonderful news. We love this kind of thing. Uh, somebody should go out and do that right away. Oh, what I'm not telling you, let's go back a minute, is if you start with these molecules in their highest state, of course, there's still non-adiabatic couplings to the lower states. There can be inelastic transitions to these states. Well, I've tried to prepare you for this. Inelastic transitions are bad. And indeed, if we look at the inelastic scattering rate, it also, of course, shows these features at the resonance. And more importantly, the magnitude of inelastic scattering rates are almost as big as the magnitudes of elastic scattering rates. And so this is saying, if you have an experiment where you need elastic collisions, like in a Bose condensate to mediate the mean field, for example, then every time there's a collision, an elastic collision that does what you need, there's also going to be somewhere an inelastic collision that throws molecules out of the trap. So your experiment would not last very long under these circumstances. Right? The, these inelastic rates are going to tear you apart in a time scale too short to do certain types of experiments. And so the, the bad news is, when I collide molecules in these two states, there are large, strongly field-dependent inelastic rates. Okay, and you can't get around that. The good news, however, is that there are large, strongly field-dependent inelastic scattering rates. Why is this a good thing? Well, remember, there's essentially no collision data at these low temperatures for polar molecules. What you could imagine doing is trapping some of these molecules, uh, measuring the loss from the trap, changing the field and measuring it again. And because there's such a sharp, strong feature with electric field, then it is a way of mapping out, uh, mapping out really the interactions, among other things, a way of testing our simple model of long-range interactions in this. And in fact, when you tell experimentalists about this, they tend to be happy about this, because there's, at last there's something we can measure. Right? OK, but uh, that's not the whole story. What if you wanted to do Bose condensation of molecules? Well, you can't use these states, because the, the rates for inelastic scattering are too high. But you could, a, a simple fix would be to go to these states, the, the so-called strong field-seeking states which can't have any inelastic collisions if the collision energy is way down here because there's no other state to go to. And uh, I mean, it, it's a technical thing. You would have to, it's a different kind of experiment that traps these than the one that traps those, but that's not really that big a deal. 
What matters more is that when these two things come together, this potential is not confined to long range. This potential adiabatically correlates to something down there in the mouth of the dragon. And so we have to come face to face with what happens when two molecules come together. Well, on the other hand, um, I mean, I want to emphasize again, I don't want to deal with that just yet. But let's suppose that these molecules can scatter elastically from each other in this state. Let's suppose for the moment that chemical reactions, how am I doing? Okay, good. Let's suppose that chemical reactions don't happen down there and the molecules somehow miraculously survive. I mean, in fact, we don't know, right? Um, once they come out and scatter elastically in this, what we need to know is what is their phase shift in elastic scattering. And the phase shift, by the way, at ultra low energies is usually parameterized by the energy independent scattering length. So we need to get this one number out. How do we do it? Well, there's an already existing technique in the cold atoms community for measuring scattering lengths, uh, due originally to Paul Julian, and it's photo association. And Paul Lett will give you a lot more details about this, so I can be very sketchy. What we propose to do here is, photo, I should say, ordinarily for the alkali atoms, photo association happens at optical frequencies because that's where the transitions are. Here we want to do it in microwaves. We want to say two atoms come in just above this threshold. We drive them with a, a microwave photon resonantly to one of these bound states. And then once they're up there, well, they're still coupled to these open channels. They're going to decay out some way with their own rate constant. And again, there's an observable associated with this, which is the loss of these molecules from the trap as a function of the microwave detuning or as a function of the electric field. And the, the real upshot is that the rate constant for this process to come in on this channel, be promoted, and leave on one of these high, uh, channels with higher energy, the rate constant for that is proportional to the stimulated absorption rate here, which is more or less the frank condon overlap between the open channel wave function here and the bound state wave function here. Okay? This wave function, we think we know because it exists at long range, and we know what the dipole forces are. This wave function is, when we're at large r, pretty much just an oscillating thing with a phase shift, regardless of what it's done down here. And so, uh, as the phase shift changes due to what's going on down here, the overlap integral between this wave function and this wave function changes, and so this rate constant has a sensitivity to what the scattering length is. Okay, so to make a, a short story long, we've made some, some quick estimates in this model of what kind of rate constants we might expect as a function of the electric field we can apply and as a function of the scattering length in that lower energy channel. And all I want to get across here is that there's uh, an order of magnitudes sensitivity here to electric field. This is something that would give you a, a, a shockingly apparent change as you sweep the electric field. And also, there is a change, of course, as we go from one scattering length to the other. And so it is conceivable that experiments of this time will f help us figure out what the uh, scattering lengths of the polar molecules are. So with that, let me summarize. I've told you about this new set of states that we call field length bound states of two molecules at long range, you have to have an electric field present. Uh, and they may even be useful. I think of them as the crowbar that we're going to use to pry open the theory of cold molecule collisions uh, because you can think of them on their own simple terms and sort of neglect the hard stuff for the time being. Uh, it remains to be seen, of course, to what extent that really will help us understand the experiments. And finally, I want to just give one last little uh, jab here about control of, of collision, of, um, of chemistry. Let's suppose that the molecules do react when they get close together. That is, what if these molecules go in, go down there, and invariably turn into water or something? Well, we can still turn that to our advantage. If we do, and again, this is borrowed from cold atom collision theory, if you tune your microwaves to a repulsive potential up here, this is called shielding, because now the molecules are promoted to this, and they just roll out here without ever experiencing what's going on back there. And now, you could imagine detuning this or changing the fields or something to bring the molecules ever closer together and to see, do they react if they're this close? Do they react if they're this close? And, and just go on down and map out the reaction pathway. This is speculation, by the way. We haven't done anything like this except basically to draw this picture. 